Okay, I have saved the best for last with the uh, chapter 20 material. And they're the rearrangements, the Cardius and the Hoffman rearrangement. I'm going to start with what you should expect when you see them and how to recognize them, and then we're going to go through the mechanism. And hands down, these mechanisms are probably one of the most confusing mechanisms you will ever see in all of Orgo, in Orgo 2 and Orgo 1. At least in my opinion, that's the case. So let's start with just what they look like and what to expect of them. Let's start with the Hoffman rearrangement. The Hoffman rearrangement will always involve two things. A primary amide, meaning a carbonyl with an NH2 on it. And however many carbons attached over here, let's make it two. And then over the arrow, you will always see the following two things. Br2 and OH minus. And usually there's some heat to go along with it. And this is called the Hoffman rearrangement. The other rearrangement you will see is very similar in the way the reactant looks. Still a carbonyl, but rather than NH2, you have N3. And they will draw N3 one of three ways. Either this, N minus, single bond, or sorry, yeah, single bond, and triple bond N, nitrogen in the middle is positive, or they'll draw the resonance structure of this. Where it is double bond O and neutral double bond N positive double bond N minus. So the courteous rearrangement will look like one of these three. Okay. But the product that you should expect from them is the same. Okay? So what ends up happening is in both cases, you are going to be removing a carbon. And that carbon you're removing will be the C, delta, the C with the double bond O. Basically, all you're going to do is go into the product, erase that oxygen, erase that carbon, and connect the two ends together. So let's start with the Hoffman and see what we should expect from this. Based on what I'm saying, I'm just going to redraw it and get started now. So I have one, two, the carbonyl carbon, and NH2. Now what I said is, you're going to remove a carbon, this carbon right here. And so the double bond O is going to be gone. Now, actually before I do that, let me number things so we can keep track of where everything should be. So we have carbon 1, 2, 3, and nitrogen 4. Here I have 1, 2, 3, and nitrogen 4. What I'm going to end up doing is erasing carbon 3 and its oxygen and connecting 2 to 4. So erase that bond, erase that bond, and now stick them together like that. So carbon-3 just disappears, and what it, it ends up leaving as CO2, and in, when we draw out the mechanism, we'll see why that is the case. In the case of the courteous rearrangement, it's much the same. Find your C double bond O, let's number this again, 1, 2, 3, 4. Redraw the exact same thing, double bond O, N3, and we'll label this 1, 2, 3, and nitrogen 4. And again, what you're going to do is you're going to erase carbon 3 and its double bond O, erase the bond that went to them from 4 and 2, and now connect 4 and 2. So 3 is completely gone. But also, one extra step for the courteous is that N3 will end up becoming NH2 at the very end. Okay? So notice, we ended up getting the same thing for both rearrangements, because I started with the same reactant, just N3 versus NH2. But the idea and the way these reactions work are the same. This is the general, the general shorthand. And remember, if you're going backwards, you're adding a carbon with a C double bond O. And the way you can figure out what that should look like is, let's say we're just going backwards with the Hoffman. Well, redraw what you have here. 1, 2, and 4, NH2. All you have to do is draw a double bond O in between the bond of the carbon and the nitrogen. And then maybe draw that a little neater because this should be bent, right? So 1, 2, 3, carbonyl, NH2. Same thing with the courteous rearrangement. If I say 
that this here was the product of a courteous rearrangement, just draw, redraw this, put a double bond O there, and remember the courteous rearrangement starts with M3. So it should look like this, and then I just have to draw it out more neatly. Double bond O, M3. Okay? So that's a trick for going backwards if you have to. You're adding a carbon. Here I have one, two carbons. Here I have one, two, three with a double bond O. All right, so what's the mechanism of these? Why am I saying this mechanism is nightmarish? Because let's look at what happens. We're going to start with the Hoffman rearrangement mechanism. So we said we have a primary amide and some number of carbons reacting with OH minus and Br2. No particular order. They're mixed together. Well, OH minus is a base, and like a base, it's going to pull off a proton. And the proton it pulls off will be one of the two protons on that nitrogen. So that OH minus comes down, grabs that proton, and the electrons are going to form, um, well, you can either, you're basically forming an enolate of sorts, right? An enolate is normally an O minus carbon, carbon double bond. Well, we just have the nitrogen here instead. So the electrons will swing down, this will swing up, and you'll have double bond, or single bond O minus, double bond N, and remember, this is in resonance, where it is double bond O, N minus H. So we know who's going to do the attack, just like an enolate. The oxygen will swing down, reforming its double bond, and this will go, in, go out and attack something. And the thing it attacks is your Br2. You're going to end up attaching a bromine to that nitrogen. And so you'll have double bond O, NHBr. Okay? So already it looks kind of weird. But now what happens? One more time that OH minus is going to come in and deprotonate your nitrogen. So grab that proton, and now your nitrogen is going to be negative. And so you'll have double bond O and minus Br. Okay? And this is where the Hoffman and the Curtius start end up start to look the same. So from here, I'm going to draw out both reactants. Or I'm going, to, I'm going to draw out the Curtis reactant, and we're going to compare it. So we said that the Curtis, um, the Curtis reactant looked like this, with an N3. N minus with N2 plus on it. And like we said before, N2 plus is a good leaving group. We know N2 plus loves to leave. And same deal here. Bromine right there, halogen, likes to leave. So think about this for a second. Those leaving groups are attached to something that's negative. So normally the negative thing goes out and doesn't attack. But here we're ha we have a leaving group, and usually things with leaving groups are the recipients of attacks. So what we are doing is we are making a nitrogen here or here in either rearrangement, we are making a nitrogen that is both functionally negative and positive at the same time. While it goes out and makes an attack on something, it is going to be attacked at the same time. And that is why this rearrangement and this mechanism is so weird looking. So let's follow the arrows. We know that this will want to leave, so that's going to be always one consistent arrow you can expect. But what are the other two that are required for this rearrangement? Well, let's start with the N minus. If I just looked at this as C double bond O, N minus, we know that nitrogen loves to resonate down like that. And this could swing up. Now, my question for you is, why does that oxygen normally swing up? Let's say there's a methyl there. The reason, of course, is if we just did this one arrow, there would be five bonds on that carbon. A bond has to break to make room for it. So here's the difference between what we usually expect and what happens in these rearrangements. Yes, that N- is going to swing down to try and make that carbon-nitrogen double bond, but rather than the oxygen bond swinging up, it's a different bond that breaks. Because remember, this nitrogen with the leaving group needs to be attacked as well. And so what ends up attacking it is the carbon-carbon bond on the other side of the double bond O. In both mechanisms, this is the case. Okay? So let's continue with the Hoffman, and then we'll come back to the Curtius. Okay? So, but these are the three arrows that will be the same in every rearrangement. Your leaving group leaves, 
your nitrogen resonates down to the carbon bond that is attached to the double bond O. And then rather than the double bond O swinging up, the carbon-carbon bond next door breaks and goes and attacks the nitrogen. So based on though that, our next intermediate that we should expect is, let's number our carbons, it'll make it easier to see. One, two, three, and nitrogen is four. So we're breaking the bond between two and three and connecting two to four. Okay? So we have one, two, three, the bond between, oh, sorry, two and four. The bond between two and three was broken, so two could attack four, and four made a double bond to three. Three still has its double bond to O. We didn't break that. So here's the other weird looking intermediate. We have nitrogen, double bond carbon, double bond O. I'm gonna write out that carbon so it's a little easier to visualize. Double bond C, double bond O. And that's carbon three right there. So all we did is basically switch the order of the numbers. Two and three basically switch positions relative to the nitrogen. Okay? And it turns out that this is the same intermediate for this set of arrows too, because this carbon ends up attached to the nitrogen, the nitrogen double bonds to the C, and the double bond O stays the same, taking out the leaving group. So this intermediate right here is the same intermediate for both rearrangements this, from this point forward. Okay? Now what is going to happen? Well, usually in these rearrangements we forget to write it, but there's always water floating around. If we think about the Hoffman rearrangement, there was an OH- minus that pro got uh, protonated, became H2O, and we still have that H2O here. The first thing that will happen is this H2O is going to protonate your nitrogen. So that nitrogen will go and grab that proton and the electrons go back to the OH. And now you have carbon, nitrogen, and H positive double bond C double bond O. And we saw before when we had C double bond O H positive, electrons like to move up to the oxygen, the thing that was positive. Well, here we have C double bond NH positive, but it's the same deal. The electrons of the double bond want to move to that nitrogen to neutralize it. And if we did that one arrow alone, this carbon would become positive because it lost the double bond's electrons. So now another molecule of water will be attracted to that carbon because it would otherwise become positive. So an H2O molecule comes in and attacks the carbon. And so now what do we have? We have two carbons bonded to a nitrogen, H. It is now neutral because that double bond swung up, became a single bond, and that carbon is still double bonded to an O, but now we have H2O attached, H2O positive. Okay. Now think about what we want. We said that we're going to kick out a CO2 and be left with an NH2. So what we need to do is get we need two fewer hydrogens on this oxygen, and we need one more hydrogen on this nitrogen. So this nitrogen is going to want to deprotonate the oxygen and make it neutral. And so we'll have this intermediate here. Carbon, carbon, nitrogen, H2 plus. Single bond C, OH, double bond O. Now we want to kick this NH2 positive out. So we need, and we want to break it from this carbon bond. So this has to happen. The carbon bond is breaking, giving its electrons to neutralize the nitrogen. Now, if we did that one arrow alone, this carbon would become positive. So something has to swing down or kick that, make that bond want to break. And what can happen is this oxygen swings down because remember what CO2 looks like. CO2 looks like C double bond O, double bond O. So we need to make another double bond O and this is the easiest way to do it. So now we have Carbon, carbon, nitrogen, H2, plus almost CO2. We have CO2H positive. Because this OH is down, now, but it still has its hydrogen. So the last step of the reaction is just deprotonating that OH. Whatever's floating around, maybe water, grabs that proton and swings over to the oxygen, and now you're neutral. And that's the general idea of the courteous rearrangement mechanism. It's a nightmare. It's confusing. It's really crazy looking and I really hope you don't get asked a question on it. 
on the exam, but here it is if you do. Okay?